Well, welcome. Uh, how's the sound back there? Too much? Too little? Just right? Both yeah. the sound. Well, my name is Zach Sarkis. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of the New York Hemp Lab. Um, we're 501c3. It's uh, really here to help build community as well as build a, a support system to help businesses and communities engage with and, and build in the cannabis industry. And we're really, really happy to be partnering with Rock Normal. Um, obviously, there's a, a team in green here today. Um, they're also a not-for-profit 501c4. Um, really can't give them a big enough thanks or shout out. We're here today to talk about medical cannabis. Cannabis being all things cannabis. That's hemp, that's, that's marijuana, that's medical marijuana. Um, realistically, this is a plant that has a ton of value um, and so we're going to be looking at it from a, a broad perspective of, okay, here's this plant, here are these chemicals that interact with our body, whether it's hemp or whether it's uh, medical cannabis, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. But yeah, back to a rock normal. Um, they are consumer and, you know, industry advocacy group, and I've had the luck to be hanging out with them this past year and working with them. I took a trip down to Albany, one of their many, many uh, I guess we lobbying days. Um, and you know, working one-on-one -on -one with the people who are making decisions of what cannabis is going to look like in New York State. This group has put time, time in and time out, uh, countless hours into supporting something going through uh, that's going to benefit more people than just you know people with money and really I feel like we see eye to eye to what this cannabis industry can bring to the table and again yeah just really uh, obviously if you've been following the news recreational cannabis did not pass um, and to a degree that's sad but to a degree if you know there's certain foundational requests that you know, Drug Policy Alliance, Rock Normal, the Start Smart Coalition have been pushing that makes, that will ensure this is a inclusive and small, medium scale industry that, you know, can be for the people, not just for the corporation. So um, I just want to give a big shout out to Rock Normal to all the work you've been doing for our community as well, for, for the state. And again, just really happy to be partnering with these guys. This is the first of, of many events to come. Um, well, yeah, just give us a love. Yeah, uh, big shout out to our sponsor, um, the Next Level House of CBD in the back. Um, we have Alyssa, and they are a uh, comprehensive CBD retail store. They're also, they have a spa associated with it that's CBD related, and they're actually doing a launch of their website and their spa services this coming week. So uh, check them out on Instagram and Facebook. We'll actually share that link at the end of the event um, through our social media and stuff too, just to keep an eye out. Big things happening. Um, Got to give a shout out to Java's over on Gibbs Street for providing coffee. Um, what's the group that gave us the, the cake, get caked? Get caked. Get caked. Uh, provided some some snacks. Um, so yeah, just really beautiful thing to see community coming together to uh, support this event. Um, and yeah. So without speaking to, too much more, um, yeah, we have some incredible speakers today. There is. We have folks who are from the research side, we have folks from the practitioner patient perspective that are really gonna create a comprehensive vision of what's going on when we're talking about cannabis as a medicine, as well as what are the steps, hoops, opportunities available for people who are either seeking medical cannabis or interested in what's unfolding. And then hopefully that this conversation can help us as we move towards more comprehensive medical, more comprehensive, inclusive, and expansive medical cannabis in New York State moving forward. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Harold Smith. Um, he is a full professor at the University of Rochester with tenure in biochemistry, biophysics, and oncology. Um, I can't remember what year it was, but he started a, uh, he's the founder and CEO of or uh, Oyogen, which is a biotech startup that develops, uh, essentially targets the impossible diseases to help cure from you know cancer, diabetes, um, Ebola. This is someone who's been in, in the, in the field of medicine and developmental science who has a unique perspective of the impact and of, uh, applicability of cannabis. And he's actually the founder of Canometrics, which is a testing lab that has a strategic and different approach to developing standard, new standards, you know, really advanced standards, as well as uh, 
for quality control and efficacy of cannabis. And so he'll probably speak to that a little bit, but really just an incredible resource we have in this community, happy to have him here, and he's always got some incredible knowledge to share with us. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Dr. Hill Smith. Zach for the invitation to speak and Rock Normal for uh, also supporting the, the talk. You don't have to emphasize your taller <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Great Saturday. I just love to see the summer weather coming through Rochester and uh, um, opens up a lot of opportunities like these for me when I'm not in the teaching mode at the University of Rochester. So for uh, sake of having said it, none of my comments or, or opinions reflect the University of Rochester's opinion. Who, not getting into cannabis yet, by the way. Um, so that's why I stepped aside and decided to start a company on my own because I saw a need that needed to be filled. So with that prelude, I'm Harold Smith. I've been uh, a Rochester community member with you guys since 1986, raised my family here. Uh, they're all out in different states right now, but we still live in Henrietta. And uh, kind of all through this period of time during my training, uh, in science, my focus has been, why are there diseases? In fact, it actually begs the question, why is there health? What is that? And as a scientist, you can actually drill in more than just saying, how do I feel today? You can say, well, how's your liver doing? You know, how's your brain doing? And why is it doing like that? And what could I do to make that better? What would it actually go right to those organs that make it feel better? So, of course, cancer is one of those things where things get out of control, and that's where I started, and I started asking questions, what is control? Because I can't determine what's out of control unless I know what is control, so we studied that at the University of MIT. And as I was going through there, I found really basic things in biochemistry, so how molecules within the cells are being used, and the cells make these molecules for that purpose. They deliberately make things to create a healthy situation. And one of the things I started studying, I realized is the first thing that HIV does when it takes over your body, it turns that system off. And I went, holy smokes. So we have to try to get in front of that. All right, we have to stop that, because if we could stop the entry, stop the startup, we could actually get in front of this virus and potentially kill it. So that made me start a company called Voyagen. And um, Oyagen is focused entirely on bringing cure focuses. So out there on Jefferson Road in Henrietta, we're about a year away from bringing a new drug forward. In the middle of doing that, the federal government approached us and said, I see what you're doing with Ebola. That's kind of a novel way of, of jiggering things to fi find out where a drug target might be. Uh, I wonder if you could do that for Ebola. Because there's nothing, once you get Ebola, that's going to save you. The virus kills you in 14 days, and it takes you 21 days to develop an immunity. So all the vaccines that you see in the literature coming up being used to treat people is simply to create a zone, a wall of protection. And everyone inside that, 21 days, and they're gone. So what do you do? You have to have something where Marines in moon suit can drop in, look for shoulders and thighs, and save people who are already in peril. And so that's what Fort Dietrich asked us to do. So that's why we're HIV and Ebola company. Now that's a long ways away from cannabis here. You're probably thinking, why is he telling me this? But it shows you the mindset that I'm trying to understand what is, it nece is necessary in our bodies to actually respond in a healthy way. And I can tell you that that is not present in the cannabis industry whatsoever. None of the testing really addresses that. They simply are trying to do what you would do if you were making milk or cheese or anything else. They want to certify that there's no bacteria or fungus in there. They want to make sure there's no toxins or heavy metals. And then there's a few things you want to measure. In milk, it would be calcium, right, or protein. In cannabis, it's CBD, THC, and those kind of things. Now, I measure 14 different chemistries, and I know how much this particular product has in it. And I sell it to you based on CBD or THC content. I tell you, it's 500 milligrams in this whole bottle. Now I can tell you, I'm very interested in the person in this room who could tell me what that means. 
because I don't know what that means. I don't know what 500 milligrams of CBD in an oil means. I know that if there's 10 milliliters in that bottle, that every one milliliter dose is 50 milligrams. Okay, I got that. But what does that mean? Why would I choose that product? And the answer really is you choose, you develop medicines and you choose products because they are targeting certain of those molecules in your cells that create health and disease. You have to know that. And you have to know how close you're coming to doing that in order to know you have a product. If you want to develop a better product, you have to have some kind of bar that you're always comparing to. And you're saying, hey, so I'm getting better. I'm getting closer to this all the time. That doesn't exist in our industry, in the cannabis industry. So we have to understand what dosing is in the cannabis industry, and it has to go beyond a box that has nothing in it but a bottle that says 500 mg CBD, 100 milligrams CBD. There's even confusion of what full spectrum and broad spectrum was, and I, I really thank Zach for, for putting together a glossary that hopefully all of you receive that you understand what those definitions really mean. Um, and, and with that kind of understanding, um, and please interrupt if there's a question, if I'm going too fast on this. I want to change from now, if everyone accepts that there's something in our body that we need to basically focus on, that the product is interacting with, then I want to focus on what that is for cannabis. All mammals, and we had a conversation, what do you think about whales? Whales are mammals. So all mammals have the ability to respond to cannabis. And why is that? It's because we've been mowing lawns and eating cannabis all the time as this primitive organisms? No, the system that responds to cannabis is in our bodies to help control the tone of our metabolism and our day-to-day -day function in our minds and in our immune system. It is a system that is throughout every cell in every part of your body. And here's the little secret. It exists because it makes cannabis. It makes cannabinoids. The human body could be illegal because it makes cannabis. And so these endocannabinoids, as they're called, are made from the fats within our membranes. Our cells make those, and they ship it out to a neighbor cell who says, oh my gosh, I'm seeing an endogenous cannabinoid. So I'm going to change my response. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change my way I work with sugar or the way I grow. The cells in your body are modulated to what we call homeostasis, which means you know constancy. And disease is a break away from the constancy. So the endocannabinoid system is a very complicated system. It exists in every cell in your body, in every tissue, and it's operational 24-7, responding and making cannabinoids, even if you never took any from a plant. This is our system. All right, now with any system, clear water, drop in a colored dye solution, and boom, there's a spread that happens. And that's what happens when you eat, inhale, or apply cannabis from a plant. We're going along every day with our endocannabinoid system controlling and modulating our temperament and our tone in our body and how much we respond to the environment. And in we take cannabis and it goes right for that system and it mimics it. And so it displaces our own cannabinoids, occupies the space, and starts telling the cells to do things in different ways. That's a powerful drug, all right? <laughs> There's no way about that. It's a powerful drug. And so what we have to understand is it is not a drug, but when you take in full spectrum, full plant material, there, is a, there are 110 cannabinoids, about 80 terpenes, and all sorts of flavonoids, and all these complicated plant chemistries the plant makes by its own self sitting out in the sun. All these complicated chemistries come upon this system in our body called the endocannabinoid system. They just descend upon it, and they start pulling levers and pushing buttons and everything else, and then we create a new tone. That new tone is what people seek. They try to seek that feeling beyond getting high with THC. There is a feeling beyond that, and every strain of cannabis gives you a different feeling, gives you a different time when you might get hungry, gives you a different compensation for pain, and that is all those 110 chemistries, those cannabinoids, settling down onto your cells 
pulling the levers and readjusting your homeostasis, your endocannabinoid system, and saying, this is the direction we're going to go on now. All right? This is the plateau we are on. That's why that is such a powerful effect, and it's called the entourage effect because it means many things working together. Right? And so that's the entourage effect. That's why pure THC is a high, but it's not the feeling that you really are looking for. If you're looking for getting high with THC, for example, and you're trying to be energetic and thoughtful and creative, you don't want to be sleeping. And there are different strains that do that. Likewise with hemp. Hemp has everything in it except the THC content, and all those cannabinoids actually will make you feel different, more energetic, control appetite, control your immune system, so if you're inflammatory. I was reading the other day that there's a thought that maybe CBN can interact with your skin and cause hair growth. You know, immediately my pupils dilated, and I just saw that. I thought, wow, that would be better than transplant. So, um, a lot of things are going on with the plant to create this entourage effect. And it's not just two things equal one plus one equals two. Sometimes one plus one equals minus one because not all of the cannabinoids actually work in a positive direction through those pathways. Some control negatively, like some will displace THC. And so although you think you've got enough THC to have a certain effect, if you take a full spectrum product, it can knock that down so it's not as effective. And that's why some of the balance in treatments for rare forms of epilepsy still have THC in it to a little extent, balanced with CBD and CBN, because they're trying to create that kind of balance response because it's causing your whole body to respond to it. So what I advocate is the understanding that Cannabis as a plant extract is a very complicated set of chemistries. And like a handshake, if I reach out to you, we're able to do this because each of us has a hand. All right, if neither of us had a hand, we may want a handshake, but we couldn't. So plant cannabinoids could not shake our hand, affect our body if we didn't already have a way to respond to it. We are built to respond to cannabis, period. Nothing else counts. That is a scientific fact. We are, are rigged to do it. The question now is, if we understand that system well enough, can we use the right combination of cannabinoids, the right plant, to aim us in the direction that each individual is trying to achieve? You may not be overtly sick, but in the case of my elderly mother, she stopped eating. And there's no, no way to argue around this. If you stop eating, you're going in only one direction, okay? That's really the problem. And she went into directions that was affecting her mentality and everything else. So the first thing I had to do was get her to be interested in food again. And cannabis does that for people who are on chemotherapy for cancer or who are aging and no longer saying they can taste food or want food. Having daily dose of cannabinoids really motivates the appetite. So she moved has a new place, has an adventure, I can't even find when she's home for a phone call anymore. <laughs> My mother has almost as active a life as I do now, and she's 91. So, you know, maybe that's genetic, I really hope so. Uh, but um, the point is that she has a system in place that I could ask her to manipulate towards a positive end result. In her case, it was to try to motivate diet. And for each of us, we have to understand what that is and what part of our body is capable of changing what we would like to see changed, and then pair that. It's like pairing wine with anything else. You have to pair the cannabis mixture so that it has that best effect for you. All right? This is a very personalized medicine for us coming forward because we have been wired to respond to this kind of medicine. So. Uh, there's a lot of detail in science that I could talk to you about, and I think if we have some questions, I might actually be able to amplify how we respond and what we do. But I thought with that kind of introduction, um, we would field some questions, and I see if I can take it any further from there. Yeah. Can you want to tell briefly the difference between how CBD acts with your body and how THC does? Well, okay, so the difference is, and, and scientifically, I wish I could give you a real clean line on that, 
but because we've been blocked from doing research on cannabis for so long, there's only certain details. Those are our cells in our body that make up our tissues have on their surface antenna, essentially. We call them receptors. And those receptors have open grips to them that when the cannabis comes by and touches the top of the cell, the grip changes, and that change, just like I can feel it all the way up into my arm, tells the body of the cell, THC is on the outside, it's knocking on the door. And the cell, because of this antenna, it wiring into my body knows exactly what to do next. That's because we're wired with the endocannabinoid system. We know exactly what to do next. Okay, so it grips. Now it turns out that CBD can compete with the binding to that receptor, but doesn't quite change the same grip. If anyone holds their hand up and just bends your little finger versus your thumb, has you tried that? And now feel your arm and see what happens when you do the thumb versus the little finger. Right, you can see that this muscle with the little finger, the thumb with the outside, is the outside muscle on your That kind of change in the protein that is called the receptor tells you a different story inside the body of the cell. So it knows that although THC is the prime binder of that receptor, CBD is present. It's not quite binding the same way, and so the response needs to be different. Now, why is that important? Because those antenna exist on almost all the cells in your body, and yet they're wired differently inside the body of the cell. So THC could bind to a receptor in your nervous system and create psychotropic effects and other things, whereas in the white blood cell, it would tell the white blood cell to not be so reactive to foreign substances to tone down the inflammatory response. In the white blood cell, CBD does that better. All right. In the brain, THC does that better than CBD. And so it's not just that the fact that we're wired, but every cell in your body understands how to use that antenna to respond to create its own balance and tone. So that's why your liver is responsible for certain functions, your brain is responsible for others, your kidneys for others, and yet all together they're responsible for life. And so the endocannabinoid system, the THC targeting receptor, and CBD targeting either the same or different receptor. There are about 80 different receptors for cannabis and 110 cannabinoids. I haven't said anything about terpenes or flavonoids yet. This is the undiscovered country, if I have any to say. And what we're all doing now is the largest uncontrolled clinical trial that has existed on the planet of the Earth. Because everyone is trying something, everyone is producing something, Extracts are being made of certain strains and they're being sold for other things, and it is a grab bag of stuff going on. Uh, as a scientist, I think a little bit more temperance needs to be involved in that, and we need to actually have a package insert in those boxes that say this has been tested and it's known to be good for such things. Not just 500 milligrams or CBD from this bottle, because that is useless useless information to most of us right now. It's useless to me and I'm a scientist trying to figure it out. So you have to start somewhere. New York State says, hey, test chemistry and report it. And when I know these chemistries, and as I said, if I know there was a bunch of THC in this product, I could say, okay, 16% THC. That is gonna be something different than 0.3% THC when I take this product. There's no doubt about that. But if the full spectrum is there, one plant with 16% will not give you the same effect that another plant with 16% THC does. And that's because all those receptors in the different parts of your body are saying, hey, wait a minute, it's not just THC here. There's 80 different other things in here. And so we're gonna to respond to that collectively and override THC. And that's basically what we're looking at in the products. If you just buy products based on THC and CBD content, and you're, all you care about is how much THC is in the product, you probably can skip this lecture, all right? But I'm talking about people who are actually looking for relief for particular diseases, who are seeking the complexity of plants. You think about all the things that are good and bad in drugs, opioids, they come from plants. Aspirin comes from plants. Penicillin comes essentially from a mold. We have been using plants because that was, as, as people, that's what we tried to understand our environment use it as tech. So um, I'll stop there and I hope I got that question, Steve. Yeah. It sounds from what you're saying 
that it is it's irresponsible on numerous fronts. It's irresponsible of the FDA. It's irresponsible of the University of Rochester Medical Center. It's irresponsible of manufacturers, and it's irresponsible of the end user to just be going out and buying these products and using them and not knowing mm -hmm. what it is they're ingesting in, 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 into themselves. If we're trying to use these to help ourselves, based on what you're saying, we don't know, all we know is we have 500 milligrams in this product, but we don't know what it's doing in our bodies. Did I, is that, am so I hearing you correctly? Let me say that again without what seems to be implied judgment, all right? Because I'm not judging this. I recognize, having raised three kids, that this is a process, and that if I respond in the moment to a certain thing, I could get it wrong, because I don't really know where this is going. So it was absolutely essential that this revolution happened in cannabis, because the federal government wasn't even gonna react to HIV. I mean, 30 years ago, some, they weren't even going to try to develop a, a treatment for HIV. So we have that, that group, scientists, and I'm part of it, part guilty, is steeped in the rigor of process. This is a proof. And if, we, if people are dying while that's occurring, a lot of people are going to die. So there has to be a part of this that says we have to take a risk. And that's what this revolution in cannabis has said. We have to take a risk now. Strains have developed, there's different types, we really don't know what's going on, and that's why a doctor cannot prescribe cannabis. It doesn't fit the standard of care that the AMA, American Medical Association, has recognized because the standard of research is in place. So there is a lot of lack of responsiveness. I don't know if, so in the medical community, the responsibleness is to only do and recommend what is considered the standard of care. Cannabis is not that. All right, so the cannabis, the standard of care is based on the FDA approval of what needs to go forwards and the American Medical Association deciding what treatment, surgery, procedures, and things like that need to be there. And that's based solely on research and research outcome. And that took time to accumulate FDA approval and then it's standard of care. So to at fault a doctor for not aggressively pursuing cannabis is asking them to take a huge risk liability legally and lose potentially their license if things go south with legalization. Right? So I don't say that that is not responsible. I say that they're stuck with a certain standard of care and they can't get out of it. Now in terms of the industry, the revolution has created a bonanza. I'm willing to bet more than 90% of the people who have jumped in are not going to be there in two years. Because the rigor that's required to bring a drug to market responsibly where every single time you buy that product, it is the same result, like Tylenol, like Advil. You can anticipate the outcome of that because of the rigors involved. That industry has actually been driven by money, and I don't think any of us will disagree with that. And there's a certain focus on money that doesn't allow you to focus completely, and so I feel like that is not really responsible. Uh, but I understand the money grab, you know, certainly. Um, Do you feel, though, that, that individuals are at risk because you just, it's almost like the supplement industry, when you go into a GNC yeah. or something like mm -hmm. that and buy supplements, you, you, there, is, there is the ingredients are listed, but there is no sense of, like you mentioned before, the purity of those ingredients mm -hmm. and what those ingredients are doing in your, right. your body and what they do in my body can be different from what right. they do in her body. Absolutely. So there's a huge buyer beware, it sounds to me from what I'm what I'm interpreting Absolutely. What you're saying. And but it, so does that need to be communicated to people that you can get this product, but we really don't know what this is going to do. I for think you. most people who are selling products will say that. They couch that you know, so this has been some there's some reports that this has been good for alleviating pain. And so we recommend this product, and let's say it's a salve or an ointment. And there's, I have not heard someone come out with this is anti-cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. No, this is absolute. The only place where you'll see that, interestingly, is in the cannabis mixtures that have come through FDA approval, Fed Food and Drug Administration, that are being used to treat children with rare forms of epilepsy. And that has gone through the rigor of testing. Until that happened, people were selling their homes and moving to Colorado so that they could put their children close to Charlotte's Web. 
All right, and legally. Now, that push of individuals, one might argue, is not responsible, that it basically is like a Hail Mary for your kids and whatever is necessary, maybe it's not responsible, but it was necessary to open up cannabis as an area where drug development needs to occur. So in, in a packaging situation of anything, even if it's like protein in a, in a protein bar, each of us is different genetically in a number of ways, and that includes the endocannabinoid system. We are tuned roughly to say the same thing to cannabis when we see it, but the extent to which we can respond or not is genetically controlled by what we have inherited. So when you go into a nutraceutical environment where you're gonna buy things, dose matters, obviously, uh, but also you matter. And that's the really one of the parts I wanna bring into the, this discussion that cannabis is able to work because we are set up to respond to it. It's not like this is a foreign thing. We are set up already to respond to it. And so that setup is genetic. And even when you're looking at drugs, say, for something that might be more straightforward, like treating a cancer or treating HIV, clinical trials will show you that 15% of the people that should respond don't. And the explanation for that is what? And that's why in the silent voice on anything that's advertised, one of the side effects is death. You know, is it likely that you're going to die from, from what the, the drugs you're taking, Humira or whatever it is that they're advertising on TV? Well, they couldn't bring the drug to market if death was 90%, you know. But so there's some rare, first, rare group of genetic in, in, individuals that may respond to this really adversely, so watch out, consult your physician. And cannabis will have the same thing. Now, a lot of things will sort out uh, in the future as science starts revealing what is the best cannabinoid or combination to approach a certain tissue and a certain disease. That's going to take some time. I'm asking that we may have to, as a community, decide that we don't have time to waste on this. We need to support science and support more of a science conscious expression when we sell products. We need to say what this really means and what it doesn't mean. So I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I wouldn't say, you know, stop all this stuff. It's all nonsense. Stop selling things. Um, because that really belies the fact that we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for all of that. No, I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying that. I'm just saying that the university and FDA, that the university needs to be responsible, it needs to step up, mm -hmm. and needs to research this because it is an academic institution. And to me, it has abrogated its responsibility to this community. Only in, in one way is that is that really wrong, what you're saying. And, and I'm sorry I'm using the wrong word. This is a teacher. I never say people are wrong. but. It, it, it is an error, and that is, imagine the leading employer in this community closing. Do we need that again? Have we seen what that looks like before? And that's what would happen to the University of Rochester if they started making research broadly available on a federally illegal substance. They depend on research grants, and that's the first thing that would go, and you would see people lose their jobs left and right. So the university, so by then I'll, then I'll stop. This university, SUNY Albany, every academic institution in this country has to get together and has to tell the government to get their head out of their ass and research this because people's lives are at stake if they're taking stuff that they don't know how it works in them. That is against the Hippocratic oath of first do no harm. They are doing harm by abrogating that responsibility. Knowing something's out there and not doing anything about it sounds like the opioids. Yeah. 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 And this will happen again because this is unregulated unregulated and people will be hurt by this not help by it and we should be here to help people. What mitigates a little bit of that risk is that the amount of cannabis you might have to take to kill a cow <laughs> is more than one could consume literally. But what so. else can it do to us in our, in our bodies that would not be up? As you said, yeah. sometimes it's a negative. Anyway, other people can ask questions, but that as a representative of the university, mm -hmm. you can take that to Mark. He's right. going to do nothing with it, but you can take and it. And I back. found myself facing a wall. Exactly. And so I said, all right, I'm going to found and become CEO of a company because I think that this is a need that needs to be filled. Uh, will everyone do that? I don't know. But this is, this is why I'm here today. So, Thank you. Yeah. You had a question here? I thought your, your hand was up earlier. Uh, uh, no, I didn't raise my hand. You have a question. Oh, sorry, and I'll come back around because he was... A lot of the 
pharmaceuticals push drugs on a daily basis that have all sorts of horrible side effects. And so if we're going to take this approach over here, then you're going to do nothing. You have to take a risk. And marijuana is also then, isn't it benign or non toxic rather than some of these pharmaceutical drugs that they're pushing? Um, they, can, they do cause that. They cause those liver problems. They cause all sorts of problems. And a lot of the people that are using cannabis are getting off of these prescription drugs. So that right there is, I mean, they're not going to give up their drug if it's not working. If, if cannabis isn't working for them, they're not going to give up their drug, right? And yeah. so I'm just trying to make the point of how it works. There's evidence that this does work, mm -hmm. and, and you can't have this uh, fear mongering that just because it's not thoroughly tested, because the drugs that are being FDA approved have all sorts of horrible side effects that people want to get off that drug, and that's why they turn to uh, medical marijuana often. Is that a right thing to assume? I, I agree with what you're saying. The, um, you know, Tylenol and Advil, most of us would consider, hey, you got one, you know, and we just take it. But those have serious effects on your kidneys and liver. And if you're going to take 600 milligrams of Advil, Advil four times a day instead of an opioid, you're looking at some serious metabolic problems happening. All right? No one has done enough research to know that, we, that the following is true. Cannabis does not have serious toxic effects. None of the research is done to really know that. But also, what we always hear from the naysayers, um, most specifically doctors, is there hasn't, we don't know the long-term side effects. Mm -hmm. But we know, the long, we know the side effects of these drugs that are being pushed on a daily basis that can kill you. It says, has been known to cause death, mm -hmm. has been known to cause cancer, mm -hmm. has been known to cause liver disease. And yet, they're hiding behind this, this uh, nonsense excuse, attacking cannabis, that not enough research has been done about. They're still pushing drugs that the research has been done and it's doing all this damage to people. So it's, it's I, the I known, say it's really hypocritical yeah. that, they, that they do that. It's the known things. And, and so this is the real catch is that the standard of care, I can't emphasize that enough. Doctors are up against this in training and as a legal obligation. Right, I understand. Okay, so, so they, they have literally cannot say, right, right. you know, they can recommend. And so if you're taking something for cancer and you went off of that and decided that you really believe cannabis could cure cancer, I, ha I wouldn't there recommend that for my own family. Right. There's, there's too right. much risk right. there because we don't know enough for sure. But if you're looking at pain relief, if you're looking at diet, if you're looking at epilepsy, and there's a list, I can provide people with this, there's a list of things that are now getting enough data where people are saying, you know, there's probably truth to this, that some form of cannabis could mitigate the symptoms of this disease. So I think you're absolutely right. And what we need to understand is that the government and the United States agreement with how drugs come to market has flaws, and, and yet that flawed system is what we can have to work against to get anything approved by the FDA so that a doctor can legally say, you know what, I'm gonna start you out on 500 milligrams of some form of an extract. And before a doctor can do that, we have to get the research behind this so that we can say definitively, this helps here. People's, people's feeling about how it does. Uh, in, in my neighborhood, around my house, there are a lot of people who feel like cannabis is helping them. <laughs> and, and, and I just hope that I haven't led them astray, but I start people at very high doses of CBD when they ask me. They say, oh, should I go in and get a 10 milligram gummy? I said, you might as well stick a pencil in your eye. This is absolutely doing nothing. Right. Any, it, it, this, you have to get a significant hit right. and hold it there. And here's the other part about it. Everyone who, everyone who knows about taking THC for getting high knows that if you do it every single day, even the best stuff is not good after about a month or two. And why is that? Well, we know that because all those antennas in your cells, when they see cannabis every single day, they pull those antennas back in and wait till it's safe. 
So my question is, when we're dosing people, even with CBD, shouldn't we be talking about on regimen, off regimen, off regimen, off, to tease that system so that the antennas always stay up and work now? No one's talking about that yet, but that's a fundamental understanding of the science. It hasn't come forward. So I, I don't want to leave the impression that I think I know everything, because what I know is I really don't know very much at all. One of, one of the things is like, for instance, an uh, antidepressant drug, okay? I see the commercials where they, they say they can cause suicidal thoughts and tendencies. When I smoked cannabis, believe me, I, I, I didn't feel like killing myself. <laughs> so it, that's the evidence that I need. I don't want to take a risk. See, it could go both ways. When you see these horrible side effects from these drugs that are being pushed on TV, I don't want to take a risk with a drug that is going to make me depressed and suicidal. Delusional. You will think that suicide is your option. And right. you're not alone. Well, what I'm saying is that the cannabis would help, helps a lot more. I've talked to people that had depression. They tried the antidepressants, and then they tried the cannabis, mm -hmm. and they, they to their take, personal, you know, everybody's own, different. Everybody's own, different. Yeah. Their personal own experience. Own has more than just, oh, I'm really sad that I don't have a lot of money, or I'm sad my Absolutely girlfriend or my wife right. or something. Right. It's, it's an ambiance of the entire way that you feel up towards yourself. And cannabis is manipulating the endocannabinoid system. So I'm glad to hear your story because this is exactly what changed for my mother. When she started eating again, she stopped asking me how to commit suicide. So. You know, I don't. I can't tell you scientifically why you and she are having that experience, but uh, I keep sending your kids. Yeah. So. so we got uh, time for just like one or two more questions. Want to throw that out? And I'll try to make the answer shorter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can feel good. Um, just a quick thank you for those great explanations there. I really appreciate that. And, um, also, it resonated with me when you said that our endocannabinoid system is given to us Mm -hmm. The one thing I was thinking about trying to understand the basics of it, when you're talking about our, re our 80 receptors that we have, is there technology out that you can see exactly what you're deficient in or how many receptors you have in one specific area, and then you can look at a plant's breakdown and almost give yourself a, a perfect dose for what ails you? Like, is that the whole idea of 300? That is uh, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Where, and by the way, you wouldn't have to pay for that yeah. in Star Trek. But yeah. what, it is, what is true is that the human genetic code is mapped out to within maybe 2% of the genes. We don't really know yet how they fit together. And the types of receptors that cannabis works through are also the type of receptors that serotonin for depression and a variety of other receptors use. And that occupies the largest genetic space in our, in our code for those kind of receptors. So the answer is that information is there, but it has not been entirely annotated to the cannabis world. It's been generally known as G protein coupled receptors or ion channels or you know, and those kind of things. And that's how people in my field look for them. Uh, but the answer is the sequence of the genes for those are all known. Um, where they are expressed have been measured out. You can look on, online and find out which tissue expresses which receptor. And yet putting that information together in a context, okay, so now we know what is us, what is the context of what is the plant, and what part of that plant do we really need to best satisfy our goal internally. That part is not known, and that's why it's future. If we do enough research and people are dedicated to diabetes, cancer, epilepsy, depression, they'll focus on those things. They'll come up with a cadre of receptors and they'll say these things need to be hit in certain ways. And that knowledge will bring drugs to market. It has done for every drug in the history of modern drug dis discovery. I hope that I'm part of that. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say in response to all that was said uh, earlier, just. Um, I understand, uh, you know, the need to uh, understand the product better and the chemical compounds and the effects on, on, on the body so that the industry can, uh, you know, make better products and uh, 
understanding the full spectrum of it. But as far as being scared about uh, side effects and whatnot, I mean, just plain human understanding, we have thousands and thousands of years of, uh, you know, experimentation where, you know, it's been by and large all positive mm -hmm. and very little negative. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, just that alone, it's kind of like taking a multivitamin. Yeah. You know, you know your body, you know, responds differently to all these different vitamins, but it, 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 it's good to take all of them. And it's good to take full spectrum products. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, so you don't have to worry so much that you have a, a negative response. Right. Because you know, they haven't really been seen. But here's the negative response. You're not used to it. And, and you take a raspberry juice marked high, medium, and low THC from one of our leading brand makers. Right? right? And it's pure THC, and I take that, and holy smokes, I'm behind the wheel of a car. Now, am I going to make decisions in the right... You have a yeah, valid so, point. So you get killed not by cannabis, but by stupidity. Yeah, I understand. Okay, and so that's really unfortunate, because you can't... Uh, you know, all young people are, to some extent, stupid. And thank God they are, because they take the risks that we older people will not take. So I applaud them for that, but yet I want to save their lives. <laughs> I don't want them to die because of that. Yeah. So this is the, the, your point is spot on, that it's going to be hard to develop a toxic dose. And I just wish that it was cannabis, HIV, cannabis, Ebola, cannabis, cancer. And you could take a simple compound that was not toxic and cure all our problems. It, it hasn't happened yet. And, and it's either not the right potency or not the right combination, or it's not the right drug. So that takes research, and we need to not just be patient for it to happen, we have to actually demand that it That's does. the awesome positive side. That's you know, the, the incredible, amazing potential. You know, but you know, not to worry that, you know, because you know, from all the information I've gathered and all the, you know, what proof seems to show to this point is that there's a positive effect on pretty much every body system we have. Um, I mean, you know, maybe it's not so good to, to smoke, you know, for your lungs, but generally speaking, uh, it's pretty much good for anything that ails you, generally, you know. But that's a problem, right, because nothing's a panacea. No, I understand. I mean, there, you know, there's, some, so there's, there's more positivity, there's more potential to, to discover as far as, you know, getting more specific with it. But generally speaking, you know, I, I don't think people should be uh, following that idea and be afraid of the fact that, you know, if you have, a, like, your mother or somebody else in your, in your family that's having some kind of issue that you read and understand that you know there's a high probability they're gonna have a very positive response to that you shouldn't you know leave from here worrying but it's not going to actually work well for everyone based on the products that they select based on who is recommending it and why they're recommending it. so here's the real issue what really is important for drugs to work is patient compliance to take the dose and take it for as long as it's recommended and if people are taking cannabis for arthritis and nothing's happening for a while and you go, wait, if you only waited six more months, it would have happened, they're going to stop taking it. So that's lack of compliance because of perceived not working like that, right? And also lack of recidivism in purchasing those products, which kills the industry. So the industry is at risk by putting products that don't have, like, the arrow, boom, oh, I see the arrow. No, I'm not seeing this. You're going to have to take this for six months. That is going to be a stress point for us. So we need to get to where we understand the products better and recommend those to the people at the dose that will have the zap effect. And that's what we, I think we need to do. So I really appreciate the questions, and I'm glad to take any more afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harold. Um, and yeah, we'll actually, after our next speaker, we'll have time for, we'll have a little panel discussion, so if there's more questions to ask, uh, it'll be, we'll have time there, so don't feel like we're cutting you short now. Um, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the UUU Art Collective. This is the UUU Art Gallery, um, local Rochester group that's been grinding for years, putting on events, um, helping young artists get their art shown from Rochester to New York City. Um, this space opened up this past spring. We're going to do a little bit of facelift. They're going to be have some big, beautiful windows you can see in the space, but they have events going down here every week. Um, they have new artists showing their work local, people who are on the up. This is just a platform that's 
uh, really, yeah, for the community. I'm just really grateful that they're sharing this space with us today. So just a big thanks to you guys. So our next presenter um, is based on an organization in Buffalo. Um, David Deutsch, he's a managing partner of Flower Wellness. Um, and they are a health and wellness organization out of Buffalo that's working with patients and practitioners to help facilitate the process of entering the medical cannabis um, process in New York State. And they also offer uh, endocannabinoid support and services. So they have a great uh, presentation today talking about their experience with the industry as well as yeah, from a practitioner patient perspective. So really looking forward to this and let's welcome David. consumers, with clients that come in and want to just understand the, the industry a little bit better, want to understand the medical uh, marijuana program. Uh, just, I mean, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of difficulty in understanding what's happening and, and what options you have for yourself. So we help facilitate that. Um, and I can get into more specifics. Mainly, we're putting together a space in the Orchard Park area where we're going to be bringing together various practitioners uh, they're going to be providing support services to really target your endocannabinoid system. Um, so we're, we're in the process of putting that together. And a main focus of ours is building partnerships with people like Dr. Smith uh, to get a better understanding from a research perspective, bringing the most up-to-date information and research into our practices and helping the, the practitioners facilitate their treatments in the, in the most up-to-date and, and um, correct fashion. So I'm going to start here. here we go. So we like to say we're a full spectrum health and wellness organization. Uh, full spectrum, kind of pointing that term from the hemp industry or cannabis industry at the moment, uh, meaning a full spectrum of cannabinoids. We offer a range of different services, as I mentioned. Strategic partnerships is uh, really what we focus on, working with people like Dr. Smith and other researchers in the area. Uh, education, doing events like this, one-on-one -on -one consultations, we do all the time. Uh, we also do small group events and, and larger events as well. Uh, and then working in hemp retail. Uh, mainly, uh, not emphasizing that as much, but really focusing on products that are, are vetted, understood, um, regulated a little bit uh, more so than what's available in the public right now. Um, and just understanding how that can affect you uh, moving forward. So today we're here to really talk about the New York State Medical Marijuana Program. And what's important to, uh, to understand is the language. Language is really important in how we, how we talk about this program. You know, you'll hear, me, you're, you'll hear me today refer to it as the Medical Marijuana Program. Marijuana not being a scientific term. Uh, we refer to it as cannabis. But currently in New York State and a lot of other states, that's the term that they've chosen. It's the Medical Marijuana Program. So I'll be using that term today. Um, and Dr. Smith kind of touched on this a little bit earlier that doctors are not able to prescribe cannabis at the moment. That's, a, that's an important thing to understand. Uh, you know, what they do is they recommend. You recommend a certification for a specific treatment. You recommend a product at the dispensary for a specific purpose. Um, so the recommendation process and the certification process uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about today as well. Um, so currently, and we talked about this a little bit, there are two uh, FDA approved cannabis derived products on the market. These are pharmaceutical products that are actually derived from the plant. Um, but we also have some synthetic products that are available as well. Um, I'm not going to go over that too much, just understanding that the FDA approval process doesn't necessarily mean that a drug is safe. And we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier as well. Um, 
question on that there too. So who can certify? Yeah, sure, appreciate that. Um, so who can certify? You can uh, find a practitioner on the New York State Medical Marijuana website, uh, the medical program. You can uh, search by zip code, who's available in the area, uh, what specialty they practice in, whether they're you know, psych or chronic pain, uh, or just general practitioners. Um, you, can, you can search by that and find out who's available to you, what they charge, uh, what the services they provide included in that. Um, it's pretty wide ranging who you can access and what they offer. You know, you can go online today, fill out a simple application, uh, do a video interview, and for 50 bucks you can uh, get a certification. It's pretty simple. Is that the best way to go about it? Uh, me personally, I would say no, um, but it's definitely a way that people are accessing the program currently. Um, and it's, it's not gonna go away. So that is something that you can do. Uh, what we recommend is to have an in-person interview or consultation with a practitioner that's certified in the program. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, it's a two to four hour certification program that the practitioner goes through. You can be a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. Uh, the only caveat is that the physician assistants have to operate under the supervision of a physician that is also certified in the New York State Medical Marijuana Program. Um, we, I mentioned earlier our strategic partnerships that we've developed. One of our partnerships is with a nurse practitioner who is licensed in the New York State Medical Marijuana Program. Uh, he's able to certify patients, and we work directly with him to facilitate pretty much everything soup to nuts. Uh, when you come in, we'll answer any questions for you. Uh, if you have any about the program, the process of entering it, what to expect at the dispensary, um, there's a lot of detail that is involved with this process that, you know, that $50 online application may not answer those questions for you. So we provide that included in the service, uh, the cost of the service to answer any questions and work with you uh, for the entire length of the certification that you have. Um, important note at the bottom there, practitioners are required to uh, consult with the New York State Prescription Monitoring Program that's built into the, the uh, rules and regulations of the program to understand what type of pharmaceutical products a patient is taking before they enter. You know, um, contraindications is a, a big concern uh, for a lot of people, and this kind of touches on what Dr. Smith is working on, um, you know, how those drugs are interacting with your body, and then contraindications with other pharmaceutical drugs and how they're interacting with a new product that you're introducing to your body is extremely important. Um, we're gonna you know, work towards figuring that out a little bit more. So the big question today, um, how do you become a patient? Uh, so step one, before even step one, you might wanna do a little bit of research. Going online, how do we do research? You type it into Google, everybody does that. So type into Google, medical marijuana program, cannabis in general, try and understand the plant, understand what's offered in New York State. Um, we have different rules and regulations depending on what state you're in. Some people know that, some people don't. I still meet people to this day that don't even know that we have a, a medical marijuana program. So we're really, um, it, it, it really depends on who you talk to, um, what type of information people have, and it, it's a work in progress. Um, so this is the website that you can go on and you can find out information about practitioners, how they become certified, you can find information about, as a patient, uh, what you have access to. Uh, there's, there's more information that we'll go over, but this is really the step. first step is signing onto the website and looking up to find a practitioner. Um, and like I said earlier, those are listed uh, on there and you can find a region, you can find a uh, specialty, what they provide and, and what type of services they provide. Um, Again, you can apply online or you can do it in person. I always recommend in person. It just tends to be a little bit more of a thorough consultation. You can answer any questions. It's just a, a better interface. Um, if that practitioner decides that medical marijuana is appropriate for your condition, what you're looking to address, then you can begin the certification process. And with our practitioner, what we work, what we, uh, what he does is, it's essentially a 45 minute to an hour consultation, some background information. If you already possess a diagnosis that's on the list of qualifying conditions, it's a little bit of an easier process because all they're doing essentially is 
matching the criteria to the requirements of the medical program. So if you're already diagnosed with cancer or HIV or epilepsy, um, that process is, is a lot easier. The practitioner that you may already be seeing, if you do possess those diagnoses, may not be a licensed certifier in the New York State Medical Marijuana Program. They could pretty easily become one if they wanted to, but if that isn't the case, they may refer you to a, a certifier that they know, or you can go on the website and search for one on your own. Um, that's an option as well. Um, so the little visual at the bottom, uh, once you're certified, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to the next stage. This is a website that you have to access, mine.newyork.gov. Uh, you may already have a profile or account set up with that website. Sometimes you need to use it for tax purposes or health insurance purposes. Uh, there's a range of different tools and applications you can utilize on this website. Uh, but this is the website that gives you access to the uh, medical marijuana data management system. So practitioners use it and patients use it. It's sort of the portal system. So, the practitioner certifies you through the State Department of Health, and then the patient is obligated to register themselves with New York State in order to get an identification card. Um, Flower Wellness, we help with this process because what we found is that a lot of the individuals, the demographics that we're coming across, um, tend to have less access to the technology in order to do this. May not, may not have a printer, may not have a computer at home, may not be savvy enough to navigate the, the system and register themselves. So included in the certification process, we'll sit with you and help you fill out, uh, start an account, help fill out the information and get yourself registered. And uh, an additional bonus to that is that at the end of the certification process, we'll help you register. You can print your temporary ID out right then and there and go straight to the dispensary from your appointment. So, I work with this program weekly. Um, I work with patients directly. I'm the one responsible for the interaction with the patients and helping them uh, fill out this process. So one thing that's important to note is if you are doing it on your own and you're a potential patient, there's some technical difficulties with the my.newyork.gov website and Apple products. And I found this out the hard way. So registering uh, with the my.newyork.gov website, it's, you gotta use Mozilla, Chrome or Explorer. I've had discussions with the program themselves. I've been on the phone with them several times trying to figure out why this is the case. Apple products are so ubiquitous, but it's just the problem. You'll find educating yourselves more and more about this program, this industry, there's little caveats all over the place and a lot of gray area. So I'll answer more questions about that if you have them later on. Uh, so if you do have an account, fine, you can log in, get, you know, start working with the data management system. If not, you can register and create your own account. Um, and then this is sort of the top of the page here where there's different applications for various things. Uh, and then you scroll down and what you're looking for is the health applications button. It's got that uh, symbol for healthcare there at the top. Um, and once you enter that, that's when you can enter the medical marijuana data management system. So as a patient, any type of issue or concern in the future, this is, this is where you'd be going uh, to, to address those issues. Um, you would hit start the registration process here and then a new page pops up. One thing I will say too is it's a very, very slow website. You have to be very patient. I sat there clicking the mouse five times and then all of a sudden it was like, all right, we're done, not working anymore, shutting it down. I wasn't able to server when I wasn't able to do anything for the rest of the day. So clicking it once, it might not do anything for 30 seconds, um, and you'll realize how long 30 seconds feels at that point, but patience is a virtue. Um, and you'll see here, please do not upload a copy of your New York State DMV ID. It'll ask you on there, this is another one of those little caveats, it'll ask you to put in your New York State driver's ID card. That's how they match your information to what the certification has. Sometimes there's a disconnect. You know, you might have a different address on your driver's license than you actually live at. Um, these are all potential problems in the future with the certification process. If there is a typo for whatever reason on any document, that can set you back um, really. And then you have to call and you're, waiting, you're on hold and it can be a 24 hour to 36 hour problem that you, know, you have to resolve. And 
I, I deal with those regularly. It's it's a nightmare, but we're getting used to the system and figuring it out, and hopefully they improve everything along the way. Um, so you have to answer basically three simple questions on that page. You put your driver's ID. Uh, you confirm you know everything is is appropriate on the identification card. You match the picture on the identification card. That's a, a, an obligation on the page. If that isn't the case, and for some reason you get stopped at the dispensary, you're like, hey, this doesn't even look like you. That could be a, a potential problem in the future as well. Um, so after your registration is approved, you get the temporary ID card. Um, that's printable right then and there. The combination of your printable temporary ID, your New York State issued ID, and your certification allows you entry into a New York State dispensary. So those three items are really important. Uh, once you receive your registration ID, a permanent one that you get in the mail, printed you know, like on a plastic card, um, that in concert with your certification will continually allow you entry into the dispensary. On that registration page that I mentioned earlier, you'll have an option to designate caregivers, which is a really amazing and interesting service uh, that the New York State program provides. You're allowed up to two caregivers per patient. And what this means is a caregiver is allowed to enter a dispensary on your behalf. So if you're a patient that is bedridden or disabled or you know hospitalized for whatever reason or just incapacitated, not able to go to the dispensary physically for yourself, uh, we have patients who have tremendous um, anxiety and, and PTSD and public spaces being in that type of facility can trigger a response. So allowing somebody legally to go on your behalf and purchase product and transport it to you uh, is a really amazing service that they provide as well. Um, so up to two caregivers per person. Uh, they, the patient will enter the inf basic information, date of birth, uh, address, uh, that type of stuff. And then beyond that, the caregiver has to register themselves and get their own identification card. It's a totally separate process that they have to go through. They gotta set up a mind.newyork.gov account, go through the same uh, uh, process there. So we touched on this a little bit. I think people are generally becoming more and more aware of what conditions are qualifying in New York State. Um, these, are, these are the conditions right here, highlighting the main conditions that we tend to see Chronic pain is by far the number one condition that people are reporting when they uh, are seeking medical marijuana. Um, neuropathies is up there as well. And uh, PTSD we see quite a bit in our uh, office just because the practitioner that we work with, he's a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner and he tends to draw uh, patients in the, the psychology area as well. Um, but some of the other ones that sit up there you can see and I have a chart later that will show the prevalence of each one in New York State. Uh, so continued with the qualifying conditions, you have associated uh, symptoms or conditions that are related to that. In New York State, you're required to have one qualifying condition and you're, you're obligated to have one associated or complicated condition. So one on the first list, one on the second. So approved forms of medical marijuana or medical cannabis. Right now in New York State, we do not have access to smokable products or edible products. That's just the situation that we're in. Uh, it may change in the future, it may not. There's talks about flower uh, or the actual buds from the plant being allowed in New York State for medical cannabis users. Um, edibles, I don't see that changing anytime soon, but flower potentially. Um, the health commissioner is the one that decides what forms are allowed and regulates this part of the industry. So what we do have are liquids and oils, tinctures, some are alcohol-based, some are CO2 uh, extracted. Uh, we also have solid or semi-solid dosage forms. We have the capsules, tablets, powders that you can dissolve into liquid and drink, lozenges, and then topical and transdermal. Topicals are starting to come in a little bit more in the dispensary um, product list. Uh, you don't see a ton of them, but they are popping up a little bit here and there. And an important thing to note is that 
there's only 10 organizations or companies or producers, whatever you want to call it, that are operating in New York State at the moment. I think we have like 45 dispensaries, give or take. Some more keep popping up all over the place. I know in Rochester we have two. The second one just opened this year. Um, these are individual organizations and companies that apply to enter this program. They have to meet all of New York State's regulations and guidelines in order to process and sell products. But these are private companies, and what they're doing is providing service and a product for people to purchase. So it's not a government-funded um, program, if you will. So just a, a little demographic uh, information here. This is, I believe as of 2018, if I remember correctly, uh, the amount of registered practitioners in New York State, certified patients, just to give you a frame of reference, I mean, Buffalo, the greater Buffalo area has over a million residents. So 104,000 certified patients is a little bit on the low side, I think. New York State doesn't have as robust of a medical program as some other states, but it's definitely making some strides and moving in the right direction. So yeah, again, 2015 to 2018, um, several years ago, there were only physicians that were allowed to be certifiers in New York State, and they eventually changed that. The, the health commissioner added uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and they saw a huge uptick in the amount of certifiers that popped into the area. So that was a, a, a wonderful move, I think. And then you can see here, Monroe County, 61 practitioners, definitely on the low side, uh, thousand, almost 2,000 certified patients compared to Erie County. Um, I definitely think we have a lot more uh, room for improvement, to provide more access, more knowledge, more information to, to patients. I think there's a, a huge amount of potential patients that are out there that either don't know that they are able to access this, don't know it even exists, uh, or just maybe aren't concerned about it and don't wanna hear about it, I don't know. But there, there's definitely a lot of potential. So this is the chart I was referencing earlier. This is between 2015 and 2018. Uh, it shows, so the important thing to note here, I got this handy dandy little laser here. So chronic pain, 52,000 of the patients certified. So this is the total here, 98,100. 52,000 are entered for chronic pain, that's over half. Then you have neuropathies, 14,000. Cancer. 12,000. So those are the big three. That makes up about 80% of the certified patients in New York State between those three qualifying conditions. These are the associated conditions here. Uh, same thing. Where is it? Severe chronic pain. 71,500. Uh, there's definitely some comorbidity to, to take note. Um, you know, if you're experiencing cancer, you are going to have some chronic pain issues in certain areas potentially. You're experiencing neuropathy, there's gonna be associated chronic pain with that. Depending on what condition you have, you know, there's, there's definitely gonna be some comorbidity with that as well. All right, so limitations. I don't wanna be you know, negative about the program, but there's definitely things that can be improved upon. Um, the biggest complaint that we find from the patients that the practitioner we work with deals with, pricing, cost. That's the first question people ask, how much is it gonna cost me? So for the certification process, it's pretty wide ranging. Depending on who you go to, it could be 50 bucks, could be 150 bucks, could be 300 bucks. It really depends on the practitioner. They're, um, they're really out left to their own devices on what they wanna charge. I'd say the industry standard that the, where most people tend to fall between is between 100 and $150 uh, is generally what we'll see in the area. Um, and what that provides beyond the certification itself is really up to the practitioner. So, as I was saying earlier, oh, as I was saying earlier, only ten producers in New York State. Uh, right now, we are not able to grow our own plants as a, a medical patient, and this is a huge source of contention from patients that I interact with. Uh, they want to be able to grow their own plants legally and not have to pay the prices that they're paying at the dispensary and control where their uh, products are coming from. So I think they're talking about maybe allowing that. The fact that adult use legislation didn't go through is could potentially be a bonus for New York State patients. 
Um, they're talking about bolstering the program now a little bit, considering that. So this might be one area where that, that changes. Access to flour and the ability to grow cannabis in your home if you are a patient. No access to flour there. Limited diagnoses. Um, this is something that may change as well once adult use does pass. There's gonna be obviously less discrepancy between a medical patient and a recreational adult user or consumer. Um, so what may happen, this is just speculation, but they may allow certifiers to have slightly more leeway in who they recommend the certification to. Uh, it might not just be restricted to a specific list of diagnoses, it might just be, I think that medical cannabis will benefit you in this way, I recommend it for this course of action. Uh, diversity in products, there's more and more coming out, but I think that we are still somewhat limited. Um, going to the dispensaries, seeing what they offer, um, different ranges of cannabinoids, and tar like, like Dr. Smith was talking about, you know, target-specific strain profiles is an area that isn't really being talked about as much, or at all, um, and it's definitely where we would like to move forward to. Uh, my partner in the back there, Dr. Lisa Hester, she's gonna be coming up later on in the panel, and that's, that's really uh, what she's focusing on right now, is, is helping us understand how to get there, and taking that information and implementing it in the best way possible with what our company does. Um, kind of touch on that here, lack of truly customized care, and then the quality control. Um, New York State has set tons of rules and regulations and guidelines about where this needs to be. There's still some gaps and loopholes in there, some ingredients that could be questionable, uh, especially in some of the baked products that they offer. It's, it's sort of an a interesting topic. I'll leave it at that. So to go back to the list, pricing, number one issue uh, for patients. They did set a cap on what can be, off, what can be uh, uh, charged, but we tell patients to expect to pay anywhere from $150 upwards of $600 some patients pay a month. It really is specific to the individual. How much you're using, you, it, they, give you, they only give you a 30 day supply. That's the maximum you can get in New York State, but what that means to you is different than what that means to another individual. You know, some, some person might have a vape cartridge that lasts them two weeks, someone might be done with that in five days. So it's very, very individualized. Insurance, that's probably the second uh, most common question I get asked is, is this covered by insurance? We kind of go back to the federal standing, uh, THC is still a schedule one narcotic. It is very difficult for insurers to be able to cover anything related to a product. Uh, it, it doesn't happen, it's not possible right now. So they would be at risk, um, kind of like the similar, uh, a similar situation that was described earlier, where their funding, their access to monies, their insurance from the company themselves, it just won't work uh, dealing with a Schedule One narcotic. Now, the consultation, on the other hand, there is some room for insurance coverage uh, to be able to do that for, the, for specifically the consultation, the certification process. Several practitioners do it, but it's not commonplace at the moment. It's, you do have to build a relationship with an insurance provider. Um, there's lots of work that, that goes into that. Um, the practitioner that we work with currently does not accept, accept any type of insurance. I think you'll find that that'll be the case pretty much across the board uh, until the, the laws change. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Do that. Um, so again, just an overview, limitations, pricing, access, there's only 10 producers. Originally it was five, they opened it up to five more after the program started. Um, I don't see that opening up again anytime soon. Grow at home. I, Road home and access to flour, I think, are, are the biggest um, changes that could be made that are relatively easy for the program to do and would, I think, greatly benefit the patients. And that, that's what they want, uh, in all honesty. And then the individual, you know, customized care, that's kind of what we're working towards and what Dr. Smith is working towards using his um, 
testing procedures and being able to give people like us, like Lisa and myself and my partner James, who's not here at the moment, uh, he's doing an event on Buffalo, the, uh, you know, giving us the tools and the guidelines on how to affect a patient or a client in a, in a more efficient way. So we talked a little bit about the limits, what's actually working. So the fact that we have a program in New York State is phenomenal, let's not forget about that. It's a wonderful thing that patients have access to these beneficial uh, products. Really, the main thing that they're accessing is higher levels of THC. That's the main component that these products are being offered in the medical program. You know, right now you can buy a hemp product over the counter, FDA oversight rules, regulations, it's kind of the wild west out there. With this, you are guaranteed that there is some form of testing, rules, guidelines that are being followed. Uh, I have a complete list of all New York State's rules and regulations. If you have any specific questions on that, I'd be happy to show you them. Um, so there, there are procedures in place for products that you're, being, you're purchasing through the program. Um, we definitely need more research. We'll, we'll hit that home over and over again today. Uh, and then the program itself is a study. Uh, I think that there's a lack of information that's being collected, uh, data that the patients could offer to the program. Uh, I'd love to see more of that taking place, but this is essentially a giant um, uncontrolled trial, as Dr. Smith put it earlier. So policies, easy policies that, that could really advance the industry, the home grow, as I mentioned. Uh, right now, autism is a really um, popular topic of discussion and its relation to the endocannabinoid system. There's not a ton of research that I know of that's going on, but it's, there are a lot of parents out there that are uh, thinking that this could be a really, really beneficial plant to their children. Um, I think that there are, there are a few states out there that have added autism to the list of qualifying conditions. I think it's something that we should visit in New York State. And then right now, PTSD is the only psychological qualifying condition on the list. I think anxiety disorders should be considered um, as well with that. So delivery options, that is something that other states have implemented. What I mean by that is much like the caregiver that you can um, assign in New York State, there are services that are out there in other states like California that can pick up a product and deliver it to your house if you're not able to drive or mobile. Uh, I think this is something that New York State should look into as well. Excuse me. Yeah. They call me a care with which in Rochester does home delivery, and so do the, so I think, three of the original five. That's phenomenal. I, didn't, well, I wasn't aware of that. That's great. down to the southern tier. Oh, that's beautiful. You have to register for that, but they do. Beautiful. I appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you. Um, so we talked about standardized testing, Dr. Smith is definitely working on that and we need other people like him getting involved and then limiting the harmful ingredients, you know, we don't understand some of the ingredients that are being utilized and fully, I should say, um, and how they affect you. So a little bit about us, is, you know, as far as flower wellness, we provide hands-on assistance start to finish answering any questions, really hand-holding and, and making sure that you're doing everything that is appropriate for the medical program, and what you're looking to get out of it, uh, answering any questions, being there 24 seven, if you wanna call us and you're having issues or concerns, you need an advocate to go to the dispensary or talk to the pharmacist and work with them. Uh, there's really not a lot of services out there that provide that. Um, keeping up with the follow-ups, saying just calling, you know, hey, how's it going?